Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I paused that um, we could just get to over 100 participants before my formal welcome to everybody. Thank you very much indeed for joining um, a number of us at the Cornerstone Information Law team on this really glorious afternoon. I can think of no better time or place to be talking about the GDPR. Uh, the uh, format of today will no doubt be very familiar to those of you um, who have been doing lots of Zoom uh, webinars. Um, we will all uh, have a, a bit of time on each of our various topics, which I'll get onto in a sec. Uh, and uh, although they're topics which in and of themselves would probably justify um, a webinar each, um, we're going to try and give you some interesting high level um, punchy analysis. Uh, and then leave a bit of time for questions at the end. You're absolutely encouraged to use the question and answer function, which you'll see at the bottom um, of your screens um, in order to ask your questions. Um, I'll be curating those, do um, up like those questions that you particularly want answered, um, and either we'll answer them in writing as you go along, or we'll try and answer them in our question and answer session um, at the end of the seminar. A recording of the seminar will be available on our website as will the slides um, and our contact details are also available in case you are, are interested in any further um, information or advice from us. So to the formal welcomes, um, I'm Estelle de Hahn. Um, I'm uh, one of the members of the information law team at Cornerstone Barristers. I've been practicing in data protection now um, for well over 10 years. Um, and anybody who knows me knows um, how much I enjoy and am fascinated by um, all matters data protection. So it's a delight to be chairing this seminar. In particular, it's a delight to be chairing with my um, esteemed colleagues uh, who I'll introduce. Um, I'll start with Matt, John and Rucci, um, all of whom um, were uh, a number of years ago now advising DCMS on uh, various issues around the data protection bill um, and indeed John went on uh, to advise DCMS about the implementation of the act including changes required for Brexit. Um, John also acted with me um, in the case of Cooper um, which you may be familiar with that dealt with various data protection matters um, and he's currently um, working on a case with Philip Koppel QC before the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, Rucci was instructed um, in one of uh, my favourite data protection cases, um, if only for its wonderful name, the case of Etty Adier. Uh, and um, she uh, is particularly strong also in the crossover between data protection and planning, um, for those of you who are interested in that. Um, Matt has been involved um, in a number of cases, for example, advising the Ministry of Justice um, in relation to um, Ian Brady's uh, solicitor. That sounds like a fascinating case. He's also been advising mutual aid groups um, on data protection, and he worked with the Cayman Islands in relation to their data protection law. So rather a wide range um, of skills there. And finally, we have with us, um, last for it being, being introduced, but not least at all, because they're the future of Chambers, our fantastic and highly talented pupils, Christina and Olivia, um, both of whom have been working on data protection matters um, in their various uh, roles and in, uh, in seats in chambers. So um, on to uh, the overview of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, you'll have seen uh, that we're trying to cover a number of different topics. Um, they split uh, into four general topics, um, transparency and accountability, um, challenge with DPIAs and DP policies, engage in the ICO, and I'll, I'll be coming back in um, to talk about the next two years, COVID-19 and Brexit. So for now, um, I'll go quiet, turn myself off, so to speak, and uh, I'll hand over um, for the first topic. Thank you, Estelle. Um, I'll be covering the transparency section uh, of this webinar. Transparency is one of the key principles under the GDPR, and its key requirements stem principally uh, from ICO guidance as well as from Recital 39. Um, in essence, transparency is all about fairness. Um, as data controller, you must be open and honest with individuals about who you are, 
Um, sorry, I think we're moving through the slides slightly too quickly. Um, there's one bubble missing, but that's the, the recital 39 one. Um, I'll, I'll just continue without the slide. Um, the, 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 the key element really under transparency is, as I said, the issue of, of fairness. Um, and you, uh, you must uh, tell individuals who you are, um, how you're processing their personal data, and why you're processing their data. And you must do so uh, in plain and clear language. And this is where hopefully the next slide comes in. The most common way to do that is through a website um, privacy notice. A privacy notice, as many of you will know, is a document that is made publicly available uh, by an organization, and this can be a public authority, a private company, or an NGO. And that document explains how you as an organization are processing personal data and how you do so in a GDPR compliant way. As data controller, you must make that information available to individuals at the moment that you collect personal data. So this could, for example, be um, when individuals fill in an online form or when they provide you with personal information uh, through an account that they may have with you. In our experience, while well, um, website privacy notices are extremely common these days, uh, they are not necessarily fully GDPR compliant. And um, that obviously leads us to the next question, um, how do I make my privacy notice GDPR compliant? Um, as those of you who have um, worked um, with privacy notices will know, there are very many requirements um, that you need to, to meet. Um, I have mainly chosen five um, that I thought would be interesting to discuss for the purposes of this webinar. There are many more, um, but this is just to demonstrate um, the variety of requirements um, there are. First, you need to tell data subjects the legal basis that you rely on for the processing of their personal data. Um, obviously, you may only process personal data in the first place if it is lawful. So you must choose one of the six legal bases that the GDPR provides, and you must take a view as to which of these you think is the most suitable for processing activity. Second, if you happen to rely on legitimate interests as a legal basis, you must provide details of what those legitimate interests are. And indeed, best practice suggests that you um, provide some information as to the balancing exercise that you would have conducted under the legitimate interests assessment. I'm well aware that if you are watching and you're a public authority, this legal basis is uh, perhaps not one that you commonly rely on. However, there are exceptional circumstances in which you can also rely on this specific legal basis, which is why uh, I've listed it here. Thirdly, you need to inform data subjects about their rights, such as uh, the right of erasure or access. Uh, importantly, and this goes to show how nuanced the rules are, um, for uh, the right um, to object, um, this is a right where ICO guidance says that it must be um, presented to the individual in the privacy notice in an isolated form um, so that there is an emphasis on it. It cannot simply be listed alongside all the other rights an individual holds under the GDPR. Fourthly, you need to identify, ideally by name, but if not possible to do that by name, uh, by reference to a precise category, any recipients of the personal data that you collect. And this is particularly important uh, in the context of direct marketing. Finally, you need to tell data subjects if any of the data processing will take place outside the EEA. So for example, uh, on, a, on, a, on a server that is not um, located in the EEA. And if that is the case, you will also have to tell individuals in your privacy notice what safeguards you have in place um, for that processing. Next slide, please. Before I hand over to the next speaker, um, here are my four top tips for drafting a GDPR compliant privacy notice. First, the more you prep, the easier it gets. I think the key step to drafting a GDPR compliant privacy notice is really um, to understand fully what your requirements under the GDPR are. You need to ask yourself questions such as, uh, am I processing special category data? Um, should I have uh, a DPO appointed? 
or our organization, um, the sooner you answer these questions and find out what the questions are that you need to ask yourself, um, the easier the actual drafting itself will get. Second, be transparent, be precise. You do want to avoid uh, ambiguous language. So rather than saying things like, we may use some of your personal data to offer you personalized services, um, it, it's much better to say something along the lines of, we will retain your order and browsing history to make suggestions to you um, for other products, which we believe you will also be interested in. Um, and if I can just link it back to the previous slide, um, when you tell individuals who you may transfer the data to, using phrases like trusted third parties would fall under the ambiguous language category. Thirdly, I suggest that you draw up a table with four columns and you answer, when do I process personal data? What is it that I'm actually processing at that moment in time? Why do I process it? And what legal basis am I relying on? This will give you a very neat overview of the individual data processing activities that you are engaged in. And you can then actually set out that table in the privacy notice itself for ease of reference. Fourthly, and this is connected to the third point as well, consider adopting a layered approach. Yes, you need to provide the individual with quite a bit of information, but what you don't want to do is to put it all um, necessarily into one big document that will be cumbersome um, for individuals to read. And so you can use um, pop-up boxes or insert links to provide more detailed information on the various aspects of how you're being GDPR compliant. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. What about cookies? If you use cookies or any other similar tracking technologies, um, you will need to cover this in your privacy notice because cookies um, can in instances collect um, personal data for GDPR purposes. Now, importantly, explaining your usage of cookies in a privacy notice does not amount to obtaining consent. That is an entirely separate matter uh, for which a separate mechanism is required. And this is where I hand over to Olivia, who will tell you more about that. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'll just be giving you a brief update on changes to the consent requirement that have occurred in the last couple of years. Um, firstly, just a brief recap on what cookies actually are. So cookies are small data files stored on a user's computer, phone or tablet that allow online services to recognize users and store information about them. So Christine has already given you that helpful brief bit of background. And now um, if you go to the next slide, please. The consent requirement is found in Article 5.3 of the e-privacy directive. And that requires that users give consent to the use of cookies unless one of two exceptions apply. The first is that without the use of cookies, the communication would be impossible. And the second is a requirement of strict necessity. So things contemplated by the strict necessity requirement uh, would be something like an online shopping basket or providing security for online banking. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So towards the end of last year, there was a very significant ECJ judgment that dealt with Article 5.3. And there were four really important points to take away from that judgment. Uh, but to briefly set out the background, it involved an online promotional lottery where users were presented with a pre-ticked checkbox for cookie consent. And the first really, important, really important point to take away from the judgment um, next slide, please, was that pre-tipped checkboxes will not be sufficient consent for cookies. The ECJ was really clear that consent to cookies cannot be given on an opt-out basis. And in reaching that conclusion, the court highlighted that the wording of Article 5.3 has changed over recent years. Originally, the provision uh, said that users had the right to refuse for storage of cookies, but this has been replaced now by an explicitly active requirement that users must give their consent. So the court found that a pre-tick checkbox was simply insufficient for those purposes. A pre-tick checkbox, the user might not have even read the information accompanying it or even have noticed it's there. So what you need is an affirmative action on the part of the user 
And the example given in the judgment is ticking the box when they visit the website. The second important point to take away from the judgment was that the standard of consent under Article 5.3 is the GDPR standard that you find in Article 411. So that means that consent must be freely given, specific, informed and an unambiguous indication. The third important point was that Article 5.3 of the directive applies regardless of whether the cookies relate to personal data. The court in reaching that conclusion pointed out that Article 5.3 refers to the storing of information and the gaining of access to information and does not explicitly refer to personal data. The court also relied on Recital 24 of the e-privacy directive, which provides that any information stored in the terminal equipment of users of electronic communications network are part of the so-called private sphere of the users that require protection under the European Convention of Human Rights. And that protection applies to any information, not just personal data. The final point to take away from the Planet 49 judgment is that users must be informed of the duration of cookies and whether third parties will have access to them. This is part of the clear and comprehensive information required by Article 5.3 that allows users to give informed consent once they've been provided with sufficient information about the cookies that will be used. And in reaching this conclusion, the court pointed to Article 13 of the GDPR, which requires that data controllers provide individuals with the retention period for their personal data, or if that's not possible, the criteria that they will use to determine that period. So what's happened since the Planet 49 judgment? Well, in May of this year, the European Data Protection Board updated its guidelines on cookie consent. And there are two key things to take away from that update. The first relates to conditionality, by which is meant you should not make the provision of services or functions on your website conditional on users giving their consent to cookies. So that means no using so-called cookie walls. It, you should not be presenting users with no option but to press the accept cookies button if they want to use your website because that does not constitute a genuine choice under Article 5.3. And secondly, with regard to the requirement for an unambiguous indication of wishes, the giving of consent has to be distinguishable from a user's normal use of the website. So for that reason, it can't be indicated by scrolling or swiping as they would if they were just using the website normally. So with all of that in mind, how can you make sure that you comply with the consent requirement under Article 5.3? Now, it's a frustrating thing to say, but there's no one size fits all template for a consent mechanism for the simple reason that every website uses different kinds of cookies for different kinds of reasons. However, all the principles I've outlined will apply across the board and there are certainly examples of things that will never be sufficient in any context. Firstly, you should be requiring clear affirmative action on the part of your users. That means that your consent mechanism has to require users to actually interact with it rather than just click away. So you should have in the back of your mind the example given in the Planet 49 case of a user actively clicking a box on a website. Secondly, consider your website's complexity. You need to know what the specific needs of your websites are in relation to cookies. What kinds of cookies are you using? Will third parties have access to them? Only once you've considered that context can you know whether you're providing users with enough clear and comprehensive information that you're satisfying Article 5.3. But the basic rule will be that the more complex your use of cookies is, the more clear and comprehensive information you're going to need to provide your users so that they can actually give informed consent. Timing, it's an obvious point, but you must be getting consent before you actually use cookies. And finally, I've just sent out a list of no-nos and these will apply across the board. Planet 49 was really clear that consent has to be opt-in. So that means no pre-ticked boxes, no sliders set to on, and no accept buttons with no object option to reject. And finally, none of those 
conditional provision of service cookie walls that the European Data Protection Board have warned us against. I hope that's been helpful and now I will pass on to Matt to tell you about DPIAs and data protection policies. Thanks Olivia, thanks Christina. Yes, so I'm going to look at some challenges to do with DPIAs, that's data protection impact assessments and data protection policies. So let's start with DPIAs. Um, a DPIA, as you will already know, is a form of risk assessment that's specific to data protection. It helps you to identify and minimise the data protection risks that are thrown up by a specific project. Pre-GDPR, um, privacy impact assessments had long been uh, recommended by the ICO as good practice. Well, they're now mandatory under the GDPR and we've hopefully got uh, two years of experience in producing them. So the areas of challenge I want to look at are these, um, when to carry out a DPIA and the question of whether DPIAs should be made public. And we'll start with when to carry out a DPIA. Um, so under Article 35 of the GDPR, a DPIA is required whenever a processing activity is likely to result in a high risk to rights and freedoms. And this represents, I think, our first area of challenge. Um, what exactly uh, is a high risk? I want to look at this uh, in two ways. Firstly, by looking at the idea of a risk profile. So knowing what processing activities you're carrying out and crucially, what risks that they present. And then secondly, we'll look a bit more closely at the idea of what high risk means under the GDPR. So risk profiles. Um, um, a risk profile is a really useful tool that many organisations have adopted. Um, it, the idea is that you're identifying all of your processing activities, categorising the risks and crucially identifying which ones are uh, acceptable levels of risk and which are high levels of risk. Uh, and the outcome of your risk profile is that you should be identifying which are your highest risks and then obviously prioritising your resources accordingly so that you're um, performing your data protection compliance obligations in the most efficient way and the one that responds to the most risky processing activities that are going on. Um, if you've got a documented risk profile that's a fantastic way of demonstrating your compliance with the accountability principle. The accountability principle really runs through all of this and remember that's uh, not only being responsible for meeting your data protection obligations but demonstrating being able to positively demonstrate to the regulator, to um, your boards or your senior management, and crucially to data subjects whose data you're processing, that you're complying with your data protection obligations. Um, ah, so a risk profile needs to identify what risks um, are uh, presented by your processing activities, what is the likelihood of those uh, risks actually materialising, what would be the severity of the risks if they did materialise and what controls are in place to mitigate against those risks. So now let's look at the idea of high risk. So one of the challenges presented uh, for data protection practitioners under the GDPR is there isn't actually a very clear definition of what constitutes a high risk processing activity. So this means that there's actually quite a lot of room for judgments for individual practitioners and for organisations when making these kinds of assessments. Now, I know a lot of our um, attendees today are from public authorities and one tool that a lot of us who work regularly for or on behalf of public authorities are familiar with is the idea of a screening assessment. Um, and a screening assessment is a initial risk assessment that allows you to work out whether a particular project is likely to be a high risk uh, as defined in the GDPR. So effectively it turns the DPIA process into a two-stage process. So firstly you've got your screening assessment and then depending on the outcome of the screening assessment you go on to do your full DPIA. Now helpfully there are a number of official criteria uh, against which you can screen your project to decide whether it is or is not likely to result in high risk but unhelpfully they're set out in three different places. So firstly we've got article 35 of the GDPR itself um, that picks out the use of new technologies as something that is likely to indicate a high risk processing activity. And then in paragraph three of article 35, you've got three types of processing activity that the article says will involve high risk and therefore must 
uh, be preceded by a DPIA. So that's um, automated processing, large scale processing of special category or criminal offence data, and large scale systematic monitoring of publicly accessible areas. Now, feeding into that, um, you might have seen the um, guidelines issued by the Article 29 Working Party, um, I think in 2017, on data protection impact assessments, and they set out nine guidelines, and they've proved very influential um, for individual supervisory authorities across the EU when giving advice to data controllers locally on what constitutes a high risk. So nine guidelines there. Those in turn inform the ICO's own list of 10 activities, which they say will constitute high risk processing activity. Now, some of those activities in that list automatically constitute high risk and some refer back to the Article 29 uh, guidelines, which is why I've included both of those um, sources on the slide. Now, remember also that none of those lists are exhaustive. So uh, potentially, depending on the project at hand, each case needs to be considered individually and, I, and I, it needs to be identified whether there are any potential privacy risks that go beyond those official criteria. But I would have thought for most of us, that would be a relatively unlikely situation. So that's my first area of challenge, identifying whether or not a DPIA is required. I'd like to think now about my second area of challenge, which is the question of whether DPIAs should be published. Um, now, I think this is obviously something that's going to be of particular interest to those of you working for public authorities, familiar with the FOIA uh, requirements of openness, transparency, accountability. But it's also something I think that private sector organisations need to be considering as well. Um, in, because, um, and as the discussion about cookies from uh, Olivia and Christina Ill illustrates, consumers and customers are becoming increasingly more aware and more assertive um, of their rights under the GDPR. And obviously there was a huge awareness raising uh, campaign that lots of us were involved in, um, in the build up to GDPR. And now everybody knows those four letters. So it's something that's just as important for uh, private sector organisations as it is for public sector organisations. So. Is there a duty to publish DPIAs in law or in guidance? Well, the answer is no, um, but I think implicitly there is a duty in an appropriate case to publish. And I think um, the first way in which we can see that duty emerging from the GDPR uh, is the requirement to consult stakeholders um, in the course of preparing a DPIA. Now, the ICO's uh, guidance is that individuals should be consulted unless there's a good reason not to. And they recommend that in most cases, it should be possible to attempt some form of consultation. So it seems to me that logically, if um, you're giving stakeholders advanced information uh, about your project and you're inviting them to share views on how that project might be formed, um, then it makes sense that they should also be told of the outcome of the DPIA process and have it explained to them how their views were taken into account when designing the project. Okay, then secondly, there's the accountability principle. And I mentioned uh, this a moment ago in the context of my first challenge. So this is the duty to not only be compliant, but to demonstrate compliance. Um, and remember in this context, accountability goes both up and down. So it goes up in the sense that as a data controller, you're answerable to the ICO as the supervisory authority. It also goes down because you're answerable to data subjects. Um, and I think the accountability principle here, in its general sense, um, strongly implies that uh, data protection impact assessments should be published. And I think there's a strong case for arguing that in almost every case, at least a summary of the DPIA, if not the full document itself, ought to be published unless the controller can demonstrate a good reason for not doing so. Now the ICO doesn't go as far as that, but I think particularly for public authorities, that's the mindset that I think we should be adopting. Now there might be perfectly good reasons for not wanting to publish the full um, impact assessment or perhaps even a, in, even a summary. There may be, you know, I'm thinking in particular of commercial, uh, commercially sensitive information, um, but I think the default ought to be publication here. Now, we've seen this um, in action in the last couple of weeks. If you've been following um, the discussion online and in the press about the NHS X uh, contact tracing app the, and the great divide between the centralists and the decentralists, you will have seen at the end of last week that NHS X announced that they were abandoning uh, 
um, three months of work on a centralized tracing app, a bespoke tracing app, and instead adopting this Apple Google decentralized model. Now, I can't even pretend to be able to explain the exact nuances between a centralized and decentralized model. But the reason why I find this interesting in this context is that at the beginning of May, or towards the beginning of May, NHSX published their DPIA, and it was immediately picked apart by some very clever um, privacy law and information security academics. And that pressure led NHSX to uh, disclose the unredacted version of the DPIA, and that still didn't satisfy those academics. And you can see, actually, I'm not saying that this was the only reason, but I think a significant uh, reason for NHSX's decision appears to have been the numerous shortcomings that very clever people pointed out in their DPIA. Um, so I think a really, really powerful tool of accountability. Now, the other part of um, this section of the talk is looking at data protection policies. And the area of challenge I want to think about here would not have been, or at least I imagine for most authority, most organizations would not have been an especially high priority at the beginning of the year. And that's working from home. That's what we're all doing uh, right now. Um, and for many organizations, this is going to be the default way of working for the foreseeable future. So it's really important um, that, that you take this time to make sure that you've got up to date working from home policies to make sure that your organization can continue to function, your colleagues can do their jobs, but without compromising data protection uh, obligations. So what uh, things might you be wanting to think about in a working from home policy or perhaps looking to update your existing working from home policy? There are a number of things. I'm going to suggest devices is a big topic. So what devices are your colleagues using to do their work? There's a spectrum, as it were, of uh, security. Uh, I think top of that spectrum is company devices that have been issued by your organization. Um, you might be recommending uh, your colleagues to use their own devices, but with a remote uh, capability option, or you might be relying on uh, colleagues to use their own devices with no remote working uh, capability. Each of those presents their own um, individual security risks. I would suggest the most secure way, but obviously not. it's not going to be feasible in every case as an official device. Obviously the best compromise would be a personal device with official um, remote working capability. The next area for a data protection policy, policy to consider, data storage. So um, Christine's, Christine has mentioned this already. Are you, if you're using a cloud storage solution, is it an appropriate one to be using and are you using it appropriately? Uh, and I'm thinking here particularly, as Christina said, of using um, providers with servers based in the EEA to avoid any third country transfers and the legal difficulties that that presents. And I'm thinking also of making sure that your data is encrypted and the encryption in most cases ought to be the default now for storing information in the cloud. The third uh, area to consider uh, is how do we keep in touch with one another? video conferencing. Now this has been extensively covered in the news, I think as a lot of armchair cybersecurity analysts with a lot of time on their hands have been studying the source code and the inner workings of Zoom. Um, and I think to be fair, they did uncover a number of security shortcomings. And I think at least in part, some of those have been addressed, but I get the impression that not necessarily all of them have been. So you need to think about what the most appropriate way of um, what the most appropriate form of video conferencing uh, is for you depending on the sensitivity of the processing activities that you're carrying out. Um, I think for me the main uh, security issue, especially with Zoom, has not been source code or inner workings, it's been user incompetence. So this is a business to business uh, product that's suddenly been repurposed by yoga teachers, by goats, uh, by drag queen uh, bingo callers, or at least that's been my experience uh, of Zoom. So make sure you lock down your security settings to avoid uh, being interfered with by any uh, unfortunate Zoom bombers. The last um, point to consider in a, a working from home data protection policy, communications between staff. So with everybody spread over potentially some quite large distances, unfortunately for many of us, email is going to be even more of a feature of our working life. Um, now, at Cornerstone, I've been campaigning for years to try and encourage my colleagues to join me on Slack. I set up a Cornerstone Slack channel and I am the only member. And that was several years ago. So if you're uh, in my position, you've not been able to persuade your colleagues to ditch email, email is going to be even more significant. You've got to make sure that we're um, 
uh, choosing ways of communication with our colleagues and sharing files uh, and things like that that are secure and appropriate. So that's all I've got to say on data protection policies. Um, we're going to move on now to engaging with the ICO. Thanks, Matt. Um, I will ask Matt to post the link to that drag queen Zoom bingo um, in the Q&A or something later on if anyone's interested. Um, I'm going to talk about regulation during the pandemic. So um, Matt has already touched on some of the helpful things that the ICO has been doing recently because, of course, we are living in a new reality at the moment, um, testament to that is the fact that I'm coming to you from my bedroom. Um, and some of you are probably thinking, what's more annoying, coronavirus or the GDPR? And in that regard, I think it's probably the coronavirus because um, if we go to the next slide, Matt, the ICO has um, been very proactive, I have to say, in um, publishing information about the type of regulatory approach it's going to take during, uh, during the pandemic. It got, it got out um, of the trap very quickly um, in April and May by publishing um, its new regulatory approach. And in that document, which is on its website, it explained that the coronavirus public health emergency means that we must reassess our priorities and our own resourcing so that we retain the right balance in these challenging times, focusing on those areas that are likely to cause the greatest public harm. And that's always been the ICO strategy in terms of focusing on, focusing on the greatest harm. Um, but it's good to see that re-emphasized in the current environment because what the ICO has done is it's identified three issues um, that organizations are likely to face in light of the current pandemic. The first being the staff and operating capacity shortages, because of course many of um, you um, are facing situations where you're working from home and you're not in a position to necessarily comply with subject access requests as quickly as you usually would, or indeed carry out the searches in the same way that you usually would. Second of all, it looked at particularly public sector um, frontline um, organizations who are facing frontline pressures and obviously have had to as a result redeploy lots of uh, staff members to deal with the current pandemic who might otherwise have been available to do administrative roles. And third of all, of course, it, it's, it's recognized the fact that huge amounts of organizations up and down the country, be they small or large, are facing extreme financial pressures in the current situation, and that will have a knock-on impact uh, in their ability to comply with data protection regulations. Thanks, Matt. Next slide. Oh, I think you skipped one. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, as a public authority, the ICO has said, we must act in a manner which takes into account all of those circumstances. And they've, they've said that they're committed to an empathetic and pragmatic approach and will demonstrate this through their actions. And so what they're talking about there really is they're going to focus on the most serious challenges and the greatest public threats, as I said, um, but also take a very flexible approach, okay? So they've openly said they're going to take account of what economic or resource burdens um, you're facing. And that emphasis in, in that statement there on empathy and pragmatism um, runs uh, the current of all of the material that the ICO has published um, because they have, as some of you have seen already, I'm sure, um, a coronavirus um, information law blog or hub on their website with lots of useful things about working from home, about um, home testing, which we've had a question on, I think has be, um, been answered, um, and all of, the, uh, all of the various issues that have arisen in the context of the pandemic, the ICO has been quick to to jump on and, uh, and react to. Um, but they've also said they want to take firm action against those exploiting the emergency. Um, and so some of you may have seen in the news, there's been lots of people engaging in like nuisance calls um, in the context of the emergency, pretending to be contact tracers to get people's personal information. Um, really horrible things in the current, in the current context, uh, exploiting vulnerable people. Um, and that's the type of thing the ICO is really going to be targeting over the next few weeks. Thanks, Matt. So in terms of uh, GDPR regulation, um, the document is very clear that there's still the duty to report breaches and you should still be reporting those breaches within 72 hours. But that's a qualified um, duty now because they say they acknowledge that the current crisis may impact on this. Okay, so there is a little bit of wriggle room there for those who are struggling to meet that breach reporting deadline, which Ruchi is going to speak a bit more about shortly. Um, but, but that 72 hours, strictly speaking, is still there. As I said, they're going to take an empathetic and proportionate approach to reports. And in terms of the investigations after a breach, um, they'll look, they said they'll look at things like how has the crisis impacted the organization? 
So do the GDPR difficulties arise as a result of the crisis? That might be a, a, a factor that's taken into account when considering the type of breach um, and how that breach is going to be dealt with. Furthermore, any fines will take account of the economic impact of the crisis. And so the document openly acknowledges that this is likely to mean that um, the, 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 there's a reduction in the level of fines. Now, of course, fines is something that is, has been quite haunted the ICO in a sense over the last year because um, we haven't really seen any concrete um, actions um, post uh, GDPR two years in in respect of fines, but they will be coming down the track uh, and, that, and they're the type of fines um, we might think about. Then finally, obviously, they're going to recognize that SAR response times may be impacted um, in the current situation. And then just with the FOI EIR, um, for those of you who are, are in public authorities and are worried about complying with um, FOI and EIR requests, um, they've noted they still are accepting new information complaints, but they recognize that the reduction resources will impact on response times. Um, they've said they, will, they still think people should, as, as, as far as possible, comply with obligations for particularly high risk or high profile matters. And they've emphasized the importance of record keeping because of course after this, um, there's going to be a huge amount of public scrutiny about the way in which local authorities and other public bodies have acted during the pandemic. And, and that regard, FOI will play a, an important role. Thanks, Matt. Next. So in terms of um, uh, where we're going next, what next, um, they have published a coronavirus recovery document, which is the six data protection steps for organizations. Now this is, um, it's, it's all a little bit high level, to be honest. Uh, I'm not sure the extent to which it's genuinely useful for people because it's simply reiterating um, things that we hopefully at this stage, two years in, already know. But what it says is the six things that you should bear in mind as you're starting to reopen and come back to work um, are things like, only collecting data and using what is necessary, keeping collection to a minimum, of course, bearing in mind the principles in Article um, 5, being clear, honest, and open with staff about the use of their data. So, of course, some of you may be um, asking staff about their health, doing testing in terms of temperature checks and all of that. And obviously, you want to be very upfront and clear with staff if you're doing that type of thing, treating people fairly, um, securing information um, properly, of course, and ensuring staff can exercise um, their information right. Next slide. Um, and finally then, on regulation during the pandemic, what they um, have also done is they've, re, they've had to sort of reimagine their priorities for the 2021, 2020 to 2021 period. Um, and they've done so um, in their beloved form of an infographic, and the ICO loves a good infographic. Um, and these are the six priorities the ICO is going to be focusing on over the next uh, two years. And again, you can see it's very much um, a sense of um, trying to be um, assisting people in getting back on their feet. So we see they're um, supporting economic growth and digitalization, shaping surveillance that will come in, into uh, the context of contact tracing and, and other means of, of, of ensuring that people and um, the disease is kept under control and uh, maintaining business continuity again. So again, feeding through all of this is the idea that the ICO wants to shape itself as an empathetic and pragmatic regulator that will support uh, both small and uh, larger businesses in the context of uh, an attempted economic recovery over the next 12 to 24 months. So that's a really quick overview of how regulation is working. I think Ruchi is going to take over now and, and look at how personal data breaches um, are working and should work um, over the next two years. Great, thanks John. Um, yeah, so I'll look briefly now at data breaches and reporting. And um, this is perhaps one area that is a cause of constant concern for organizations, because in reality, um, things do go wrong and things can go wrong in a whole you know, number of ways. Um, so like British Airways, you could be subject to a sophisticated hacking attack, compromising the details of about 500,000 customers. Or alternatively, you may have sent off some old furniture to a second-hand shop, including a filing cabinet with sensitive personal data about children, which is what happened at one county council inadvertently a few years ago, and they were fined £60,000. Um, the bottom line, however, is that when things go wrong, a number of obligations kick in, and you need to be ready with a suitable action plan. Um, so the starting point then is, what is a personal data breach? And um, the definition is on the slide and it's, 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 in, it's from Article 4 and it's defined really broadly. And so it ranges from um, you know, the obvious loss of an electronic device containing personal data to sending data to an incorrect recipient, or indeed um, where data has been corrupted, altered, or is um, no longer complete. 
But where a breach does occur, there are three things that you need to be thinking about immediately as an organization. Um, and that is your internal records and processes. Um, and then whether you need to notify the ICO and indeed whether you no need to notify the data subject. And for the purposes of today, I'm going to fo focus on the first two issues and I'll start by looking at the obligations to notify the ICO. Um, so the question then is, um, you know, which breaches do you need to report? And actually, um, in the, um, when people were registering for this webinar, quite a few questions um, were on this subject. Um, because the test really, or the obligation rather, is that the, you have to report all breaches unless the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of the individual. So clearly this is you know, not straightforward. It is entirely context specific, but there are some, um, you know, there are some kind of um, guiding principles that you can use. So when you're assessing whether or not you need to report, the focus should always remain on two things. One, the likelihood of risk, and second, the severity of risk. And then when you go on to consider each of those issues, um, you know, while this is obviously not a comprehensive list, it might be helpful to think about various factors that I've pushed um, on the slide. So think about the nature of the breach, the sensitivity of the data involved, um, and, and the other matters that I've identified. Um, I think off that list, the most important one is um, thinking about the severity of the consequences for the individuals. And this certainly in the ICO guidance is um, the kind of key factor that you must focus on. Um, and just bear in mind that when you are thinking about the potential negative consequences, you know, think about it quite broadly. So think about the, you know, the special characteristics of the individual, think about the risks that, um, you know, the range of risks that might, that a person might be opened up to, things like physical, material or non-material damage, and indeed emotional distress. And then, of course, as I said, this is context specific. So, for example, you may have a temporary loss of personal data, um, say, because of a power failure or because of a denial of service attack. And you may, um, you know, you might be a retail store prevented from sending out emails to your customers during those few hours, which is obviously not going to be that big a deal. But in the context of a hospital, on the other hand, with patients in critical condition, even that temporary loss of data can very likely present a serious risk to individuals' rights and freedoms. And so that would be a context in which, you know, your reporting obligations would kick in. Um, so obviously weigh up the various factors and ultimately just a decision that you need to take. Um, in terms of timing then, um, you, sorry, yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, in terms of timing, uh, the obligation is that you have to um, notify without undue delay and certainly not later than 72 hours. But the starting point is when you become aware of the breach. Um, and again, unfortunately, there are no clear answers here, but the guidance certainly from um, the Article 29 Working Party is that um, you become aware of a breach when you have a reasonable degree of certainty that a security incident has occurred. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just sit back and take a laid back approach to all of this and just hope that you'll be notified by someone or you know, by the data subject or whatever. Um, because ultimately the GDPR does require you to have appropriate technical and organizational measures in place such that you yourselves are able to you know, immediately identify whether a security incident has taken place. And um, while again, this is a context sensitive question, the emphasis very much is on, you know, having those organizational measures in place, um, the emphasis on prompt action to investigate and indeed um, to put into place any remedial action that you can. Um, just a final point here, um, remember that the GDPR does recognize that it's not always possible to investigate a breach fully within 72 hours. So you are allowed to provide information in phases um, but at each stage, you should be providing the information without undue delay. And again, this is not an excuse to kind of sit back um, and take your foot off the pedal, but you are still expected to prioritize the investigation and, um, you know, give it adequate resources so that it's still um, taking place in the background, even if you aren't immediately able to tell the ICO everything that you need to um, tell it. Um, in terms of what you need to tell the ICO about, that's actually quite a straightforward list. It's probably not controversial. Um, I've got the bullet points there. And indeed, um, you know, as, as we've said, the slides will be available online. So um, in the interest of time, I won't go through that um, right now. Um, but I will touch upon my final slide, 
um, which is where I have compiled um, well, what I have called the internal checklist as far as personal data breaches go. So um, the first thing I would say here is that all members of your organization, and obviously this will apply to your processes as well, is that all of them should have enough GDPR knowledge to recognize a data breach in the first place. Um, it is in exceptionally important that the people who are doing the day-to-day -day tasks um, you know, have that knowledge because they are likely the ones to make the mistakes or be the first to you know, spot breaches. And your response plan just simply won't work if um, the people you know, who are doing the day-to-day -day tasks don't actually know enough about the basics. The second thing then is to think about a comprehensive um, response plan and to have that um, sort of set in stone. Um, this will involve you thinking about a number of things. One of, this, um, will, one of these things will be to in, um, allocate responsibility either to a person or a team to handle all breaches. So your response plan will also need to have a clear process for um, individuals within your organization to let the responsible person or team know as soon as they've um, realized that there might be a breach um, that has taken place. Um, and then as part of this response plan, you will need to consider obviously investigation duties, um, any duties to mitigate, and then finally the two critical aspects, which are um, internal recording and notification. So with internal recording, remember that the obligation is to record all personal data breaches, regardless of whether you are required to notify externally. And then with notification, re remember that, of course, um, you know, you might have to notify the ICO. And then in some situations, you will also have to notify individuals. Um, so that's it from me. And I'm going to hand over to Estelle now. Thank you very much indeed, Ruchi. So it falls to me to pull things together uh, by looking a little bit at my uh, data protection crystal ball, um, which you'll see on the next slide is, is pretty much also uh, a, an IT focused crystal ball, although I will be looking at some other bits and pieces as we go um, forward. So I'm looking at two things in particular. I'm looking at Brexit and I'm looking at COVID-19. And then I'll also say something at the very end um, about a couple of other areas and where interesting things are happening. So first to Brexit. What will be going on in the next couple of years? We know that there's um, negotiations at the moment. We know that we're hoping for a deal. And then there's a question about what happens if there's no deal. If you're fascinated about GDPR and Brexit, um, I've given you the link there. The Information Commissioner has a whole page of information um, in relation to that. I noted um, that something interesting happened in relation to the information from the government on GDPR and Brexit. Uh, you may be aware that the government used to have a website that looked at explicitly the question data protection if there's no Brexit deal, what will happen? And the guidance there was withdrawn in March this year, um, which was uh, interesting. Uh, and I suppose we can postulate why that happened. But the, the general approach is that GDPR is likely to continue. Um, everybody wants a deal and the deal will entail um, the United Kingdom maintaining um, pretty much what we have at the moment. You'll see though that Michel Barnier in the speech that he gave on the 15th of May uh, in uh, following the third round of the Brexit negotiations um, was less than complimentary about uh, the United Kingdom's position at the moment in its negotiations on um, Brexit. And in particular, Barnier emphasized that there's been a sticking point around judicial um, cooperation and police cooperation and explicitly called the government out for trying to water down or step away from data protection obligations entrenched by the CJEU, which must be talking about the um, retention of information um, and about wide scale obtaining um, of information for um, the purposes of criminal investigation. So the question is, is this just posturing or are we really looking at a position um, where the UK's adequacy um, under GDPR is going to be in balance? Uh, the answer is it's difficult to tell at the moment, but I would refer you back to what the government previously said um, in its guidance on Brexit and GDPR slash data protection, which is if there isn't a deal and there is always a potential for that to take place, then you have to be uh, putting your uh, ducks in a row at the moment. You have to be thinking about what you need to do uh, 
um, in order in particular to deal with international transfers. And you'll have seen if you've been keeping one eye on the question and answer session that Steph raised the issue around um, international transfer. Uh, and uh, if you are transferring any information overseas, you need to be thinking about your mechanisms now and putting in place, for example, model contractual terms. Um, the judgment in Schrems 2 is expected on the 16th of July. Um, the Attorney General uh, last year in December put, uh, well, quelled some fears when he issued an opinion which found that uh, um, the model clauses uh, were valid. I think that it's anticipated that the court will follow suit. I think it would be very um, disruptive and surprising if it didn't. Uh, but watch this space, and uh, if the CJEU does uh, find that model clauses are not a valid mechanism, um, then uh, my prediction, a lot of headless chicken running around. Moving on to COVID-19, a very different um, chicken-related question. Uh, I think particularly uh, the takeaway on COVID-19 is that the change in working practices has been um, embedded to some extent in the way in which um, we're going to be going forward. We are all going to be working more from home. We are going to be doing work more remotely. And data protection has become particularly important in those circumstances, particularly security related data protection. Uh, Matt gave you excellent um, ideas around uh, working from home and having your own device. And I can only echo those. The uh, guidance has been pretty clear on facilitating um, working from home practices. I also think that the COVID-19 crisis and the responses by the government to it have indicated to us the extent to which data protection is embedded in the public consciousness. And Matt touched on the contact tracing app and you just need to look at, as he pointed out, that centralised versus decentralised question um, being very much one that was in the public imagination and public concerns about privacy being for um, or paramount um, to see how much data protection has become embedded in the public consciousness. I think it's also interesting to note that the, there's a bit a, a subtle shift, I think, and that data protection is now seen um, not as a block or as a barrier on business, but as an opportunity. And as Matt pointed out, one of the ways in which that happened and was um, evidenced during the COVID-19 crisis was the way that Google and Apple immediately announced. In fact, they announced three weeks before they had developed their contact tracing platform that they were doing it and that they were developing a platform which was decentralized, wholly anonymized and encrypted. They were basically reading from a GDPR playbook. And for a company like Google, that doesn't have the best uh, privacy um, history, uh, that I think is very interesting. Um, so my predictions in that regard are the world has changed, but data protection has become even more important and embedded. And finally, I think looking forward, we've got to remind ourselves that even though COVID-19 has changed a lot about the way in which we think about the world, technology and the technological innovation that was in place before COVID-19 is still continuing apace. Where are the areas that data protection is going to be of most interest in the next two years? Smart cities, I think, is an absolute key one. And I've given there um, a link to a really excellent paper uh, by NCC Group, um, which is a blueprint for secure smart cities. It deals with all the types of technology that both private bodies and public bodies may be engaging with um, going forward with the smart city model um, and talks about the GDPR implications. And then obviously AI. We've seen that there's been consultations on AI frameworks that are data protection um, compliant, that are looking at the ethics around AI and data protection. And that is where I think a lot of development will happen in future. So that's it from me. Um, we've been pretty assiduous in answering questions um, as we've been going along in the discussion. Um, and uh, at the moment, uh, all we have is one question asking us, can we put a link uh, in, the, in the questions, which we will definitely do. Um, I'll invite everybody to come back onto the screen, um, just in case any questions come in uh, in the last couple of minutes. But um, if you don't have any other questions, thank you very much indeed for participating. I will pause in case people are typing away vigorously.
the suspense is killing us and no so i think unless any of the other participants on the panel want to say anything in closing all it um falls is for me to say thank you very much indeed all of you for attending there's one question but i think i was in the middle of my goodbye sentence so we might answer that in um, writing thank you all very much for attending it's been an absolute joy um, thank you to my fellow um, information law team members at cornerstone barristers i for one have enjoyed this thoroughly i hope you have all um, as well and if you have any questions um, for us all our contact details are there um, just before you go i'll give you a little um sort of a spoiler alert one of the reasons that we wanted to put this seminar together and we wanted to start thinking about these things is that we're going to be coming forward with quite an exciting offering around privacy notices um, in the next few weeks so keep your eyes peeled for that all right thank you very much everybody i hope you have a lovely afternoon and happy GDPRing.